Welcome to another edition of Meet the Visionaries podcast with Viet Nguyen, a current Master of Science and Real Estate Development student in the Center for Real Estate. Hello, and welcome to another edition of uh, Meet the Visionaries uh, presented by MIT Center for Real Estate. Um, I'm your host for this episode, Viet Nguyen. I'm a current Master's in Science of Real Estate Development student here at the Center. And I'm here with uh, the CEO and managing partner of Taurus Investment Holdings, Peter Merrigan. Uh, Peter runs uh, Tor- is the like I said the uh, CEO of uh, Taurus, he, which is a global real estate private equity firm with a focus on strategic investments into value add, core plus, and development opportunities. They've done over 250 deals, over 10 billion in value, over uh, 70 million uh, square feet. So. Um, Welcome, Peter. Really excited to have you here on the podcast. Thanks, Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, I wanted you to first kick this off by starting uh, talking about your background, um, why, how and why you got into real estate. And um, for our listeners, that, um, you're also an alum of the program, class of 93, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. So, uh, Yeah. I just wanted to hear about how you basically got into the industry. Sure. Uh, so I started working construction for my father, who was a, a, a realtor and a, and a home builder outside of Boston uh, in, you know, really when I was in high school and then into college. Um, so I was always, you know, working on site, building houses, uh, all sorts of general labor types of things. You know, not a lot of skilled labor from my side, but a lot of, a lot of rough, you know, rough carpentry, maybe some, uh, uh, we, a lot of, insulation, painting, you know, all this kind of different things that he goes into building a house. So, uh, but I was always on site during the summers doing that, doing construction and really liked construction, came to enjoy it. Um, and I went to college um, and got out in 1988. I was interested in, you know, figuring out what I was going to do next. I was advised by one, one of my uh, professors in college that, you know, I was, if I had such a strong interest in construction, et cetera, that I should really consider going into, uh, into real estate development at the time. Uh, I was an English major, English literature major in college. I didn't have a lot of other financial skills and things like that. The problem was, is that at that time, we we're going into the largest real estate recession of all time. <laughs> so, uh, so it was, my timing was highly inopportune. Uh, there was the savings and loan crisis, the RTC, all these other things that you know, people of your age don't remember, but I certainly do. Um, and they, they were, it was pretty much every developer in the world was bankrupt at that time. So it wasn't really the right time to be doing that. Uh, so, I'm, and also I didn't have any skills. <laughs> so, so it wasn't, I wasn't really offering a lot. Um, I tried to get into brokerage. I ended up uh, working more in kind of property management, uh, with some, you know, assets that were, that needed leasing efforts and things like that. Um, and really kind of just studied the business, learned the business, got my licenses at the time, instruction management, uh, real estate sales, you know, also got a bunch of certifications and things like that. Really just spent my time educating myself on the business. Came to 1992 and decided that I really didn't have the financial background uh, that I needed to be in the acquisition mode. And what was happening at the time was that there was a lot of securitization going on that was becoming a big movement and to clean up the mess from all these crises. So you had CNBS uh, and REITs that were coming becoming mainstream. And really, most of that stuff was done clean, you know, solving problems, capital um, balance sheet problems for lenders and for and for operators. Uh, so you needed to have a lot of Wall Street was kind of really becoming dominant in the in the industry at the time. So you needed to have that financial skill set. That's enter MIT. And that's why I went went to the program, applied, got in and um, and they really gave me the skills to to then participate in in more than just management, get into, you know, investments and things like that. And so that was that was the kind of pivot for me um in my career was that was the MIT program so um leading into that so right out of the MIT program in 1997 you um basically founded the Boston office of Taurus and I wanted to ask about one of your first deals uh, Assembly Square and really could you explain for our listeners like um the background on that and how that all came together I think I read somewhere that you were doing this deal out of your kitchen can you yeah <laughs> yeah for sure you know so yeah, I'll give you. So what happened was I, I got out of um, the program in, in '93, 
took a job in Boston, was working, um, really buying loan pools and, and, you know, other kind of highly distressed portfolios at the time, one of which was the largest bankruptcy that had ever happened in, in, um, in Massachusetts at the time, which was uh, Harold Brown had gone bankrupt. Um, and so there was a large loan pool, which was, I think we had 8 million square feet, uh, mostly of downtown Boston space that we acquired in, as a loan pool. And an old bank called Charlotte Bank financed it. Um, and we needed the equity. I would go to a different firm at the time. We needed the equity to, to, to close on this deal. And my old uh, boss who, who ran that company had um, worked with this group out of Germany called Taurus. And it was called Taurus Investment Group. And they were syndicating high net worth fam German family money into distressed real estate in the U.S. at the time. They really didn't have an operational presence. They were doing primarily the syndications into other people's deals. So we did that. I was a guy in charge of the deal. It did really well. Everything was doing well at the time. It was quite big. Um, and so I got a lot of experience executing it, um, developed a close, close working relationship with those um, two German uh, gentlemen who were brothers, uh, the rivaling brothers. And, um, and then, you know, I left the company in 1997. Um, I decided, you know, despite my very humble start in the industry that I knew everything there was to know and I could do it on my own. So I started my own business in 97. And the first project that I tied up was a, um, a large kind of what's now known as last mile industrial portfolio in Boston. And it was a couple million square feet. Um, it was in Woburn and Peabody. Um, and, and it was mostly just, you know, industrial assets that you could reposition high cash flow. I got Lehman brothers to line up the financing for me. It was about a $30 million acquisition, but the core asset for that was a large 200,000 foot, eight acre site in the middle of assembly square in Somerville. Um, and so what I decided to do was acquire this asset and acquire the portfolio portfolio was great and worked out incredibly well. The. What I saw in Assembly Square was a big industrial wasteland with a lot of bankrupt sites um, with a rail line that ran through the site without stopping, highway uh, interchange, uh, and immediate access to um, MIT, et cetera, Kendall Square, but really just urban desolation um, in one of the most densely populated cities in the country. So to me, it was kind of obvious, even though I was only 30 years old at the time, I was like, why is no one developing this? Um, and the, the mall across the street was called the Assembly Square Mall. That was in bankruptcy. It was owned by Cigna. Uh, it was an insurance company. Um, and then there was a couple of other sites around it. But this eight-acre site was right in the middle. So if you drove through Assembly Square right now, the land, there's a tower where Partners Healthcare is. The land under that building was that site. So really smack in the middle of it. Everything touched the site. So, you know, even though I, it, no one really knew that I was buying this portfolio, and by the way, I didn't have any money. So I, so it was not sure, sure that I was going to buy it. Um, but what happened was I I talked to the Rivalings. I left my other company. I called up the, the Taurus uh, guys and said, hey, you want to do this together? And they, I said, it's a great opportunity. We could sort of like the Harold Brown portfolio, repositioning some distressed assets and lots of upside. And I've got this covered land play in the middle of Assembly Square, mm -hmm. which we can then buy up Assembly Square and, and, and try to redevelop, which is very ambitious, you know, to think about at the time. But, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it all seemed to make sense. Long story short, we, they agreed to do it. Uh, but the, the condition that Lawrence Riley put on me was, we can do it, but we want to form a new company. We're getting rid of Taurus Investment Group. We want to have a U.S. operational platform. You get rid of your company, we'll get rid of ours. We merge our interests together, and we'll form a new company called Taurus Investment Holdings, uh, which is what we call it. And the three of us started that LLC in 97, and I've been running that ever since. So that's the, that's the, uh, and they've subsequently retired. I bought them out, um, of the company a number of years ago. So they're no longer involved, but that's how the company started. And that's how assembly square started. What happened after that in assembly square was that we acquired the mall, which was bankrupt, which was 26 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, we acquired that for 16 million. We acquired the site on Sturdivant street where partners is for 8 million. Um, we acquired Garrity oil, which was next to it. 
uh, Yard 21, which is the big strip of land we won through RFP um, that's along the railroad tracks where the train station is. We want that through RFP, and then we work with the city to rezone the entire district. Um, and then, so we ultimately end up controlling through, basically through the mall and, and the other pieces that we had assembled, plus, um, you know, the eminent domain program that was going to happen to take a couple of other sites, r around 60 acres of land, roughly, uh, that w and including the train station site. So, all right, so what we did was we designed the mass, we did the rezoning, we did the master plan, decided where the train was going to go, train station, that is, and then... We redid the mall. We retenanted the mall um, with a with a, there's a whole other story about how that happened. And then we sold the site to Federal Realty. Um, now, the reason we did that was because if you remember how I put the deal together was with the with the basically a few families from Germany. Mm -hmm. Assembly Square. This was in 19 when we sold in 2004. That was 20 years ago. You know, it required billions of dollars of capital. We were just were not in the place of capitalization to take it all the way at that time to take it all the way to the to where it is you know twenty years later. It required another very ambitious, very deep pocketed institution that could stay the course for twenty plus years to build out the rest of that site. Um, but what we did, we did basically what we I would call the you know the land assemblage and the master planning and the rezoning that unlocked everything for it to occur. Um, and then, and then the key piece was, the, was the, in my opinion, anyways, was the train station in addition to the land control. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I guess looking at the site today, you'd think like it's a very optimal location, like, and it's like a huge plot of land with the train station. Funny how no one thought of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> why so? Except some 30 year old guy from Milton who just showed up and bought it. You know? What do you think <laughs> other people had reservations uh, about? I think, I think my, um, I, I think. I was ambitious and naive at the same time, which happens when you're at that age, where I said, why couldn't I do it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and so uh, that was the ambitious part. The naive, I'd say, was also the funny, you know, that's that statement, because, you know, you don't realize how political things become. You don't realize how how hard it is to get massive urban development done. Uh, you don't know how you know stakeholders come at you and different things. I had no, I had no idea what I was in for, um, and it was a wild ride, but it was a great learning experience. It was very stressful, um, and it was hard, but we did it. We we stayed the course. We we accomplished it. We were able to. What's there today happened because we made it happen. We fought through a lot of obstacles mm -hmm. uh, to get it to the finish line, and. Would I do it again now? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I mean, we do a lot of big projects, but I don't take that kind of entitlement risk generally. Um, part of it was I just didn't know what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, it worked it, out. It worked out. It worked out, but it was you know. But the real estate was phenomenal. This is a great city. You, Joe Curtitani was a great mayor. He came in and said, "We're doing this." Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care what anyone thinks. Um, and so it, it required that kind of leadership to get it to, to make it happen. Yeah. So it sounds like that really set the path that Taurus uh, has eventually gone on, become this huge real estate private equity firm. Do you talk about your evolution from assemblies, that is first assembly square deal, uh, your experiences building the company and how it's really changed in the last 27 years? Yeah. I mean, so if you think about the history of how we started, we, were, we basically raised money with very, very wealthy families from Europe. Um, and what we've done is we've kind of continued that, but we've expanded that platform into the Middle East, all over Europe, Middle East, U.S., South America. So we pull those those families together and we do you know what we call our club deal business, which we, we're closing on club deal number 260 you know, next week. Um, so, so that's the series that we've done. So if you do the math, it's like 10 a year of those types of investments. Now, it's all, not always 10, sometimes more, sometimes less. Last year was a lot less. But, you know, that's on average what we do. And we work with these, you know, that network of started out being like two or three families in Germany is now thousand families all over the world. And, and, so, and then we also marry them up with institutions. We do, you know, some funds, we do um, strategic ventures and on, on some of our larger initiatives. And we have great, you know, 
corporate relationships like that all around the world as well. And, so, and we developed various strategies in various geographies. What's interesting about this is that our main business, which we've always been good at, because the first deal we did was a last mile industrial deal, which was very unpopular at the time, right? It was like, why are you buying these old warehouses near the city? You know, do you want to tear them down? <laughs> you know, we now own over, you know, around 20 million square feet of that stuff. And that's the most favored institutional product type right now, um, to the super defensible. We have a whole team out of our Atlanta office that does nothing but focus on last mile industrial or what you, some people call shallow bay. We also, then we have a, a, a multifamily vertical, which does both development in uh, the U S and in Europe, particularly in UK. Um, and then we do acquisition value add acquisition programs, primarily in the U S. Uh, then we do industrial development in Germany. We have a outpost in India, uh, where we do some mixed use development. And that's really what our footprint looks like right now. We used to also be pretty active in Canada, but we've exited all of our assets up there. Mm -hmm. So Taurus is a very um, innovative, uh, sustainability-focused ESG company in real estate, spearheaded by you. How did that, like, ESG, I guess uh, sustainability wasn't always, like, the top of mind for real estate companies. So how did you come to make that decision? And how, how did you go about convincing, like, your different investors that this was the way to go, that sustainability was the future? Yeah. So think about what I just said about Last Mile Industrial. So. What I always said about Last Mile Industrial was that it was a most mispriced asset class in in the industry. You know, there was it was trading at basically say seven cap when a multifamily assets trading at four, four and a half. And multifamily assets have far more risk than Last Mile Industrial does. Multifamily has supply risk. Um, you have its gross rents. You have exposure increases in operating expenses. Um, you have regulatory issues with it around rent control, potentially other things like that. You don't have any of that in last mile industrial. There's no supply risk. In fact, you usually have a shrinking supply. You have enormous secular demand changes in in the uh, in, in e-commerce and other things like that. Um, and you're close to the city, so you're in a highly defensible position from a land basis. So, but it was mispriced, and it took a long time for the market to figure that out. Take the same approach towards sustainability. Sustainability, to, to a lot of people, they talk about it. They don't understand it. They don't understand what it means. Um, but the, I, what I felt was that it was an opportunity, a wide open market opportunity as an entrepreneur. You know, which in my heart, that's what I think I am. I see a market opportunity in sustainability that is due to the lack of understanding. People know there's a problem around you know, climate change and around uh, decarbonization, things like that. They don't have a clue what to do about it. That's something, that's an area that you can, that, that the market is going to figure out eventually, mm -hmm. but you can either be a leader in it or you can be a follower in it. And so what my, our, my decision, similar to the last mile industrial space is let's be a leader. Let's, let's be a dominant player in that sector. And then, and then the question is, how do you do that? And what we felt we had to do was a couple of things. Uh, one was we had to build out the right team, which is not a real estate team. You have to marry real estate and energy expertise together. And, and so we had to build out, we had to hire data scientists and engineers and energy experts and people like that to understand the way the grid works and the way that um, you know, all these, these various um, components of it are, you know, fit together. And, they, and then those teams have to come up with solutions that work for the real estate team, that are creative to the return for the real estate team. And then you have to be able to explain it to the real estate team. <laughs> So it's a, it's like two different languages, two different countries trying to get together and, and marry up their interests. It's really hard to, to do that, which is why a lot of people don't do it. A lot of people say it's too hard. I don't understand it. Can't explain it. You know, and it is. It's like it's, every deal is different. Every jurisdiction is different. Every energy grid is different. Um, and I always say it's like a Rubik's cube where you're lining up all the pieces, and some of them work, and some of them don't. And so if you don't have that expertise in house that you can trust. You're not going to come up with the right solution. Mm -hmm. So, but if you can, then there's margin to be made there. It's another value add component to 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 real estate development and real estate acquisition. And and you know that the institutional clients are interested in it because they have to be. They're signatories to the Paris Accords. They don't know how to do that, but they're signatories to it. So, like they're looking for solutions, right? We have a solution that that works for them. Then you say, okay, how do you convince the client that it's actually going to work? You have to prove it. So 
what did we do? We took two of our projects, one the large master plan community in Texas called Whisper Valley, and we built out that on a carbon neutral basis, which it means we build up massive geothermal microgrids and and solar arrays within the, within the communities to deliver um, you know carbon neutral capable homes. Uh, Eight thousand of them uh, is how big that project is, and so we can go down there and show folks, hey, this is the way the energy center works within the, within a a geothermal microgrid. This is what it does. This is how the redundancy works. This is how the efficiency works. This is what the cost is. This, this, and they go down. They're like, "Oh, I understand now." You know, it's a very real estate's a physical asset. People want to see it, touch it, feel it. Yeah, the other project we did, they said, "Okay, that's great for new build," and now we're doing that at scale and in in lots of places. How do we do it on retrofit? Because retrofit's a much bigger market, much bigger opportunity. And so we said, "Well, we have a project in in Fall River called Southwinds." I wish it a 404 unit workforce housing project that we actually sold last week. So we did a full life cycle investment on that, where we did a massive decarbonization effort of close to 40,000 per unit on energy efficiency. We worked out incentives and tax credits and all that kind of stuff that, that is very, very complicated. Um, and then we, and we said, okay, let's do it, implement it, measure it. So you have to be able to measure the end, you know, you collect the data of the carbon reduction, of the energy consumption reduction. And we will have an ongoing relationship with that asset for, for the next uh, number of years because that, that was part of the deal when we sold it. And But then, most importantly, prove to the market that it's not a drag. Prove to the market that it's a credo to the returns. And that's why we went through the full life cycle of that investment, to show that you can actually make money at this. Mm-hmm. And that is when the proof of concept is what's critical for institutional investors or any investors, really. They don't believe it. It's very skeptical, right? They're like, oh, yeah, you're talking a good game, but does it really work? You know? Um, so it was, oh, it's too complicated. Why would I do that? You know, we get a lot of that. Uh, why are you doing that? And the, and the reason we're doing it is because we think it, the market is wide open, that people are trying to come up with solutions, that we want to be the, the leader in providing that solution. And we can prove it because we've done it. Going back to your original question, why we decided to do that, it has a lot to do with the European roots of the company. So the two German brothers that I mentioned before, the Rivlings, were interested in this because they see, they saw it. It was common development. It wasn't like we were breaking new ground from technology standpoint. Some of it's new. The way we were doing it at scale was new. But the concept of geothermal is quite, um, for example, was quite common um, in, in Europe. And a lot of it has to do with energy independence from Russia and, and that type of thing. So bringing those ideas over to the U.S. and bringing them over to Texas of all places, which is, you know, um, fossil fuel production mm-hmm. is, you know, it was kind of an unusual thing to do, you know, to say, OK, we're going to take this European stuff, stick it in Austin and then see and if it works there. It's going to work anywhere. Right. So yeah. and, the, and, the, and the market accepted it. So I think that was part of the, um, that, that, so I, I'm pretty excited about that. I spent a lot of time on this and I think it's a great growth opportunity for our business. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like, like you said, um, a lot of it's just reusing, um, technology that's already existing. Is Taurus also looking at innovating or like seeing like what new technologies could be out there to really help drive this goal of sustainability? Yeah. I mean, so, we, so there's a whole menu of things that you do when you're looking at a decarbonization strategy, heat pumps and batteries and, and EV charging and, and solar and, and, you know, geothermal, et cetera. There's lots of different things. And, and it's not a, it's not a one size fits all solution. You know, every deal I could tell you is a bespoke solution. It all comes up with an individual. That's why you need to have that in-house expertise. So the answer, I'm not really answering your question directly yet, but first of all, you, you do come up with, the application of the existing technologies changes from project to project. That's an important thing to understand, and that's and and so you it's not it's not going to be the same. Now, you when you then what happens is you start innovating around some of the systems that you are putting into the individual projects. So, for example, when we're doing the geothermal grid, our our we're now doing our I don't know at the sixth grid down in in Texas right now in Austin. They're very different than the first one. You know, the way that we run our energy center is we patented a certain valve design around how the energy flow, work, uh, the water flow works within our geothermal system. 
So there are things that we are tweaking within our own system. We're developing a software package of our own for measurement of decarbonization and for reporting out, which is, you know, um, I think is something that's is missing, but is going to be needed. You know, so what you want to do is be able to analyze these projects, create a capital improvement program over not just the short term, but the long term of what are these assets going to need to maintain a decarbonization pathway. Um, and that is something that, you know, I can go in there and, and fix it up right now, like I did with Southwinds, and make and bring it to a certain level. But the next guy has to keep doing it. They have to keep having a plan in place, or else it's just going to get outdated and it's going to get inefficient again and things like that. That consistent reporting and understanding of what real estate projects need ongoing to get us down to the carbon goals of the of overall society that's that's part of what we're developing with our software uh, innovation that we're coming up with as well mm -hmm. okay that makes a lot of sense but the in-house companies it's a uh, eco smart solution and renew communities right and you launched those in those platforms in 2015 and 2019 respectively yes uh, you basically have these companies like they focus on the energy and innovate and they come back to Taurus and you guys work together to figure out how this fits into the real estate puzzle. Yeah. So, so we started both of them, first of all, uh, what we decided to do at year end was to merge them together. So now it's one, now there's under one platform because we had duplicative engineering teams and things like that. And it didn't make sense. Originally the idea was EcoSmart was the new build and renew was the retrofit. Right. And that, and that's what we did. That's so renew executed Southwinds. Mm -hmm. And EcoSmart executed Whisper Valley, the one in Austin. Mm -hmm. Now we now we've merged those teams together because what we're finding is that we want to be able to offer to our clients, institutional clients, and whoever the client might be, developers. Hey, we can come up with your energy solution and your and your uh, your decarbonization solution, not just for your new build. We could do your entire portfolio, you know, under one umbrella, under one platform. We can. They offer a full suite of services on on this to to so if you're a large scale institution from Europe and you're coming into the U.S. and you want to have you know you have certain carbon goals that you have to comply with, we can do all that for you, both on your existing portfolio and your new stuff that you're building. Um, and that's why we decided to combine the platforms together. How how's the competition been um, since? Uh... You, I, I guess you were one of the first to do this, but I, I imagine now there's a lot of people really clamoring to get into this space. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. We don't see a lot of people that have, one, that that have capital and they've done it themselves, that have that say, hey, we've actually done this. You know, we can show you the project. We, it was our project. Um, and and we can measure the results. And we have our the, the old software package that can manage it. We, we know how to manage the grids. We can manage the grids forever. You know, so we actually don't see anyone doing that right now. Not the same way we're doing it. Not with the whole suite of services. Not they can do the reporting, do the design, do the implementation, do the management, and actually bring capital to the table as well. I'm sure that other people will do that eventually. There are plenty of ESCOs and things like that, but the ESCOs tend to be more focused on large institutional projects like hospitals and universities and things like that. They're not really doing it in the private commercial real estate industry. Uh, at least not that we've seen yet. Interesting. So again, going back to my initial analogy with Last Mile Industrial and mis being mispriced, I just see this as being a wide open playing field still where we have first mover advantage that eventually will close. The market will figure it out. Mm -hmm. But right now we're pretty far ahead. Uh, so I think that you know we've got that, that advantage that we're, we're going to try to maintain. Yeah, like right now I've noticed like lately in the news, like you see some negative headlines like on like the Wall Street Journal, for example, about regarding ESG. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. And it sounds like, uh, like our, you know, this is not really something that's going to impact you because you, you guys have like a goal with sustainability. But how do you see this impacting uh, ESG going forward for the industry? I mean, ESG has become caught up in the culture wars and political wars, and et cetera, in the U.S. Um, as a term. I think that's more about the S and the G than it is about the E, in my opinion. And our platform really focuses on the E, and it makes money. So, so it's like, it's profitable for the, as an investment. So it's like, I don't really see us as getting 
any negative connotation. Now, if it was a drag, if someone was making an investor do it when it reduced returns, that might be a different conversation. The challenge is to make it be accretive. And that's where I don't, we really have not been impacted by any of that uh, cultural stuff at all. In fact, just the opposite. People are pretty interested in what we're doing. You know, we're finding it to be, they're like, hey, that's, that's innovative. It's different. Um, and we think that's where the future is going, regardless of, you know, the current uh, political landscape. So I, I was curious, um, how does sustainability efforts differ between different um, product types, like industrial versus multifamily, for example? Because I don't know if there's a lot of overlap with uh, how you uh, can, you know, really push sustainability with that. So could you uh, explain? Yeah, it is very different, actually. Um, so, you know, if you're, when you're dealing with individual renters or homeowners or whatever, you know, small units versus large scale industrial facilities that generally have a lower cost of energy than the residential rates anyways, and less motivation uh, to do anything. And the landlord um, is not, you know, paying for the, the um, uh, was, or is not getting the benefit of the energy savings the tenant is. There's this whole landlord-tenant relationship, which uh, tends to get in the way. The landlord's supposed to make the investment, the tenant, the tenant gets the benefit on the consumption. That doesn't always, you know, marry up very well, does it? So, and that's particularly acute in, in the industrial sector where, and they have an operating business that they don't want to have disrupted and things like that. So, and then there's not, there's not a huge carbon intensity um, from an operational standpoint in warehousing anyways, generally. Most of them aren't air conditioned. Um, they might be heated, but even that's at a pretty low level. So, uh, so you, it's a different approach. You know, we focus a bit on in, in, in the electrification of the, of the fleet of truck trucking, which is not happening at scale yet, but we believe ultimately will be. So it's preparing the infrastructure for you know, electric charging and things like that for as the fleet becomes and encouraging that and subsidizing that for all electrification. You, there's a, a great potential solar production in certain states because that's a state by state then um, on you know, on industrial facilities. Um, that's again, if you don't have the in-house expertise, you you won't understand why Illinois is different than Georgia on on solar. You know, and they are very different. You know, you 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 don't see any solar in Georgia. And you see a lot of it in Illinois, you know, and, and we spend a lot of time discussing why that is. But so you can make money in certain states if you understand uh, the solar markets and, and how that works, because you have rooftop space that's available to do that. And, and we do it at scale, um, and particularly in places like New Jersey and Massachusetts and in um, in, in Illinois, et cetera. Um, so there's there's also heat pump. Uh, technology that we can bring to the table around the heating needs and the cooling needs with the small office uh, components that go into warehousing. Uh, but that's, so that's like, it's more around the edges. You can't do the same impact in industrial mm -hmm. than you can do in multifamily, for example. Multifamily, you go in and really, because people live there and there's a lot of heating and a lot of cooling demand, you can reduce that demand significantly with some of these solutions. And that's how you can have a major impact. So mm -hmm. it's a, so really is case for case offices of, is also another uh, component. Office has different headwinds or associated with it, but um, but there's a huge heating cooling demand there. And don't forget, there's lots of other types of real estate. There's data centers, there's hotels, there's you know um, uh, senior living facilities. There's lots and lots of different things where energy efficiency technologies can be brought to the table, have meaningful impact. Um, you know, shopping centers, uh, and, you know that that could be have meaningful impact across the board. So. It's a wide open playing field. So I guess the question everyone's just been asking is what's going to happen with office? Everyone's really um, up in arms about like, oh, the future of office. So what is what is Taurus see for the future of office? You know, office as an investment strategy is hard. We've always been a pretty big office player historically. Um, we're not now, but we've got out of the office business you know, before the pandemic, we, I mean, we're still in it a little bit, but we're, we're, we got really reduced our exposure quite significantly, uh, mostly because of the transactional costs associated with office, the um, leasing commissions and tenant improvements, which are more or less useless for the next tenant, um, you know, are very, very expensive. So office becomes a momentum play many times. If you, if you get in there, lease it up, get out. 
you know, because otherwise the next rollover of that lease is going to kill you on your basis. Um, so unless you're an institutional read or someone like that that can hold it for the long term, which we're not, but if you're in the private equity side, owning office beyond one kind of rollover cycle with, with the leases is not very exciting. Um, it's going to get really tough. And now it's, now it's super tough because the, um, the, there's a secular demand problem. It was tough when there was great demand. Now it's tough when there's, there's limited demand. What we are seeing, though, is that in certain spaces, like, for example, we're about to break ground on a new office building in the UK, uh, in London, in central London. There's a, there's a requirement, going back to the sustainability stuff, where they have a certain EPC requirement, uh, energy performance certification, that if you're not at a certain level, you can't lease the space in that building. And so there's a big tenant demand and a mandate in that particular market and in other markets, uh, you're seeing some of it in New York, some of it in Boston, where you know these these Class A buildings are will outperform, yeah. and the Class B building is going to get left behind. You know, and it's very hard to modernize the Class B buildings, and so you have a, a demand problem in the Class B buildings, but you also have a functional problem around around their energy uh, certifications. So it, it really is tough um, if you if you own some of those assets, which you know, fortunately, we don't. But um, but we do think that there is a market for that A um, energy product because that's really what the tenants are looking for. Uh, so so that's why we're 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 doing a, a speculative build in London. Yeah, I, I I was reading up on London recently and I saw that like a lot of that space is going to be obsolete like based on just the policy and a lot of stuff is like gonna they're trying to or they are currently converting to hotels. Um, is is conversion something that like for your remaining uh, office portfolio? Is that something Taurus has looked into, or is that a strategy you uh, go out? And- um, no, we're not really looking at that. We don't have, own any urban office. Everything is suburban, so um, or in our suburban. So I wouldn't say that we're we're really spending any significant time on that. It was easy to develop Assembly Square. There would be to retrofit an office. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so are there any upcoming initiatives or developments at Taurus that you're particularly excited about and would like to share with our audience? Yeah, I mean, so we, we developed a brand called uh, Novo, um, and Novo is our carbon neutral apartment living. Uh, but, um, you know, we so we are building that. The first one is just uh, opening up in in Apopka, um, Florida. Uh, and it's that's an interesting one because uh, we did it with geothermal grid like we did the Austin project. And we are rolling out a series of these around the country. We're working on one in Concord, Mass. We have another one in Kansas City. We're doing one in Austin. Um, and then we, have, we can, we'll continue that product line. So you'll see a lot of what we call Novos. You'll, you'll see more and more of those. And what that means is that we're using the EcoSmart solution, geothermal infrastructure, and the solar uh, implementation for the, um, and, you know, to, to bring down the carbon footprint of those particular facilities. The one in Florida is interesting, in particular from a sustainability angle, because what people may not realize is that, you know, there's a large aquifer that goes on to the state of Florida or most of the state of Florida, and you can access the aquifer like we did to, to run to run your loop. So our loop was significantly less expensive in Florida uh, than it is in other states to build it because we, we were able to access that, that, um, that loop, that aquifer for the heat exchange. Uh, so we think that that's a, a big area of, of potential growth, particularly where, you know, now Florida's a red state, you know, doesn't have a lot of positive policies for, for our renewables, particularly solar. You don't find a lot of solar implementation in Florida. Um, but the, you can, the, there's, a, there's a great ac- um, asset there in, in the aquifer that, that can be utilized to reduce the heating and cooling demand quite significantly in the state. And the heating and cooling demand is usually 50 to 60% of the energy consumption of any uh, uh, unit like that. So bringing that demand down to such a low level, it, overlaying solar uh, to reduce the additional electro, electrical load, how you electrify a building, you can, it's, it, it is a really compelling product. Uh, so we're excited to do that in Florida and around the country um, in lots of different markets. And, and we think that's going to resonate well with, our, with both our tenant base and with our, uh, our, our investor base. Mm-hmm. 
So how are your investors feeling about like, uh, I know like a lot of insurance companies are just refusing to insure like uh, properties in like Florida, like California. Uh, how, how, how are they reacting to that? And how, how are you guys trying to stay ahead of that? Yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of, weeks, a lot of time working on this. Um, again, it's a lack of knowledge. So if you think about our program, you know, all of our facility, we have a very um, low energy demand associated with that facility. We have, re, you know, um, everything is below ground. So we're not really going to be impacted outside of the, the grid getting shut down. We're not really going to be impacted at all by a hurricane um, in, in that particular facility. Um, we try to explain that to the insurance companies and show, we're trying to show, you know, the various things and how we're reducing energy consumption and it's good for the grid. It's built in, and we're also trying to show them, Hey, if you have a catastrophic event and you're going to rebuild, why don't you rebuild the right way instead of the old way, you know, and, and do, and do it in a much more sustainable and resilient manner. Um, because I'll give you an example. So we, we, in the Austin product we talked about earlier, you know, there've been multiple massive, um, Texas storms, the freezes that have happened where they've been quite catastrophic, massive energy spikes in a deregulated grid, uh, cost wise. And, you know, we're not even impacted by it. You know, it is part of the resilience story where, you know, the grids are vulnerable. The grid in Florida is vulnerable. The grid in Texas is vulnerable. California is vulnerable. Bringing these kind of projects into those communities, we think in the long run, as people develop an understanding of them, they're going to say, that's the only way we should be doing it. There's an education process for that. It's not going to happen overnight. So what what continues to motivate and drive you in the real estate business? Like you've been doing this uh, over 30 years. Um, what is it about this industry that really like, wait. Can... Everybody keeps telling me I've been doing this for 30 years. I feel like they're trying to kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why don't you retire? You know, there's a door over there. <laughs> um, you know, it's all I know, number one. So I think I'd be bored if I stopped. Um, I do like the entrepreneurial nature of it. I like the, I get inspired by challenges. I get inspired by trying to unlock value and do different uh, things that haven't been done before. And that doesn't come without risk. You know, I think about the way the company started with the Sunbury Square. I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was super hard. Um, but it was challenging. It was interesting. And I don't really, re I don't regret it. You know, it was, it, I saw what came out of it and it was, it was, you know, I'm really proud of it. The same thing happens with this kind of thing. You know, yes, it's, it's hard. It's, uh, it's super challenging. It takes a lot of capital, a lot of time. Um, but I think in the long run, it's going to be worth it. I want to see this. I want to continue to drive it forward, keep advancing the ball. And, um, and that's, and that's what I get. Uh, excited about and then seeing next generation like yourself coming in and saying hey it works i can take this on as a career i see an angle here where i can have an impact it's not just building it and buying another deal or you know anyone can buy a warehouse you know anyone can buy an apartment building it's not hard what's hard is to have a meaningful impact in what you're doing and and do it in a way that that you know is is economically viable that's where I think um, the opportunity is, and that it still kind of excites me. Is there any advice you like like to offer, like people trying to get or in the industry just starting out, trying to get in, based on your life experience and a career experience? Take a long view. Instant gratification is not something that happens in in real estate. Sometimes it does, but it's it's more unusual. See an opportunity when you see it. And know it and believe in it and do it. That's what I saw with that portfolio I mentioned when I got when I went out on my own. Um, and try and control your own destiny. Don't let someone else control your destiny. You know, th that's those are kind of the main things that I've always felt strongly about. Um, so, but I wouldn't worry about, you know, if you're coming out of graduate school, don't worry about what your salary is the first year or two. That's not really relevant. No matter what the platform is you're getting associated with, what the job is your, and then as you're going forward, the opportunities will open up, and then recognize them when they come your way. Uh, that's th those are the those are the key things that that people should you know have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then I guess um, 
Could you elaborate more on uh, Taurus's relationship with the center, you being a graduate, like how did that came to be and how that relationship has developed and evolved and how it uh, exists to this day? I mean, I'm really grateful to the center for what it did for, for me in my career. Um, I was at a point where, as I, as I described, where I didn't have the skills necessary to succeed in the industry. And I went back and it gave me those skills. It gave me that confidence to move forward to four years later, start my own company. You know, I mean, that's a big leap from where I was when I went into the program. I got to tell you, um, I thought that the network that I, and friendships that I developed there were terrific. I, we, own, we own a house in Montana next weekend, six of my classmates are coming to visit me there. Uh, so we're still together all these years later, still give each other a hard time, still support <laughs> each other. Um, and it's a lot of fun and we've just been super tight, you know, ever since then. Uh, so it's been an ongoing, you know, journey with the, with us and my relationship with the, with, with the center. And I, I always continue to support it because I really value what it's done for me personally and professionally over the last, you know, 30 years. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with us on the podcast today, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, really insightful. I feel like we really got to know a lot about you and Taurus. And yeah, um, great to have you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck uh, with everything with you as you, as you move forward in your career. Thanks, Peter. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another edition of Meet the Visionaries podcast. And please remember to stay tuned for future episodes by subscribing to our podcast or follow us on social media by visiting cre.mit.edu to learn more. Until next time, take care, listeners.